join us today, so I will be chairing in addition to doing the presentation, so we'll see how well that works out. Um, so, I'm, but I'm very pleased to uh, introduce this distinguished panel. I mean, we're most of them weren't actually on the panel when I first uh, put this together. Martin and I were the, the only two original panelists. Uh, David Weber, uh, as many of you know, was uh, Vice President for Professional Issues, passed away in the course of this. Alan Brinkley um, had some other commitment that prevented him from coming. So I really appreciate uh, Sarah, Teo, and uh, Jackie Jones for, uh, for joining us. And so let me just sort of quickly introduce them, and then I'll do the first presentation, providing sort of broad numbers for um, the discipline and some basic uh, sort of trend issues for uh, the academic job market. Then the other panelists will speak about sort of ground level issues about maybe sort of the lived realities of uh, the job market for folks today. That's okay. Except for Jackie, who was quick to emphasize that she's only just been elected as vice president for professional issues and was uh, sort of thrust into this really just to provide some comment at the end and to really learn from the discussion here. Um, so first, my, I'm Robert Townsend. I've been with the AHA for 21 years. I started there as a, an intern on the uh, director of history departments, and uh, with the process of sort of failing on my first effort to finish a PhD, uh, I went back, finished my a second effort of PhD just last year, and so that's sort of my story. Um, obviously, I spent most of my time sitting there counting historians and their activities. Um, the next presenter will be Martin Mulford, who received his PhD in 2005 from the University of Rochester. He's currently a full-time father, perpetual applicant, committed curmud curmudgeon, and rogue scholar. Uh, he's also written a number of really interesting articles and perspectives, which I'm always happy to commend to, uh, to anyone who's interested in those uh, issues. Taylor Weiss is former head of the AHA Research, um, Research Division, uh, and also one of the most terrific vice presidents I've ever had the pleasure to work with, I must say. Um, for his sins, he was chair of the, this is his words, for his sins, he was chair of the Department of History at UCLA from 2002 to 2005, and for even greater sins, he was uh, the chair of the Spanish Department from 2008 to 2009. He's presently a member of the ACLS Board of Directors. Uh, and then Sarah Maza is the Jane Long Professor in Humanities at, the, at Northwestern University. She served twice as department chair and is at Northwestern, and is now a member of the professional division at AHA Council. Jackie Jones, or Jackie Jones, is a professor at the University of Texas at Boston and the incoming vice president for professional issues. And uh, I'll just re-emphasize that she's only just sort of slipped into that position and uh, any comments should not be held against her. So with that as a, as a well that's right, so she's not vice president. So, so yeah. As a 445. So with that to start, I'll, I'll start with my presentation, which is, of course, sort of, I, I always feel very guilty, I guess, when I do these broad numbers, because I know that the lived experience of folks who were actually on the job market is very different from my own. I just finished a PhD, obviously, so I, I really know how, how grateful I am when I finish a PhD with a job already in hand. Uh, but, you know, I, I still talk to the other folks that were in my dissertation group about their experiences, and I don't know fairly good sense of how difficult it is, but my sort of purpose and function both at the NHA and on this panel is really to take sort of 50,000 mile up view of, of how everything looks and I, I realize that's that's not the reality that most of you live in and I, I appreciate that it creates a bit of a disjunction. So with that as a starting point, I think it's useful to uh, really look at the statistics and understand the nature of the problem and how, to, how we got to where we are today. I think the sad fact of the matter is that the history job market has been in a near perpetual state of crisis since 1970. And that's because I think we have a, fo uh, a culture that focuses, on doc focuses doctoral students on only one job market, which is primarily in research universities. And we disperse the authority to decide how many job candidates enter that job market out to over 150 doctoral programs. When combined with the often wild swings in hiring in public colleges and universities, I think we're set up for regular and near perpetual crises in the market. So let me start with the sad truth about the current state of the academic job market, which is the worst we've seen in almost 40 years. What makes this even more difficult is that it comes just two years after the best job market that we've ever seen in our tracking statistics at the AHA. Back in 2008, I was quite happy to note 
that we were seeing the highest number of job advertisements on record, with over 1,000 jobs reported that year. Unfortunately, since then, as many of you probably know, the job market has essentially fallen off a cliff, um, falling basically 46% in the past two years to just 560 positions advertised this past year. The only really bit of good news I can add, and I would emphasize this um, in contrast to the Inside Higher Ed article that I mentioned many of you read, which is that the job ads have actually been going up, and as of right now they're up about 21% from where they were at the same point last year. Um, but even with that, you can see that the, um, we're still, this would still make only a fairly small dent in the number of job ads. In, in comparison to this, actually, it's kind of surprising me, the, the number of people that are interviewing here at the AHA is actually up much more significantly than you see here. But by the end of the last meeting, we only we heard from 115 positions, which was down from 198 the year before. As of this year, as I talked to them this morning, we had 100. We knew about 160 positions. So I mean, we're seeing a big uptick this year, which is actually larger here at the meeting than it is in the job ads that we've uh, received in perspectives. So, but the trend in uh, jobs obviously is only one part of the equation, and. Um, Basically, we've been conferring about 1,000 PhDs in the discipline per year, really for more than a decade. And these numbers have been fairly consistent through the job crises of the 1990s, and again, the mini job crisis that we had in 2002 and 2003. And there are a number of factors that go into the decisions uh, to admit and support doctoral students to their studies that I'm going to get to in a minute. But I want to start by emphasizing the challenge in trying to guess what the job market would be like for a doctoral student at the time of their admission. And when you take into consideration that it takes an average of a PhD about eight years to earn their degree, any number of factors can come into play. Uh, to give you a sense of the hazards of trying to predict where the job market will be when someone finishes a PhD, I thought it would be useful to show a couple of personal examples. When I first started a PhD program back in 1988, my department chair and a significant number of really smart people, including the head of the Memo Foundation, were all insisting that we were facing a, a crisis of a shortage of history PhDs. And my department chair was really eager and emphatic about the fact that I needed to get it, and it was really important uh, for me to do that. In 1990, my wife got pregnant. My advisor, God bless him, said, you know, German intellectual history is not going to feed a growing family. Stick with the gig at the AHA. And as it turned out, that was some of the best advice I've ever received in my life. Because by the mid-1990s, we were facing a really severe job crisis, which you know, given that it was sustained pretty much the entire 1990s, is still remembered by many folks who received their PhDs in that period as, as a very important time. And then again, when I started back up in 2001, there was, I mean, I, I felt obviously a bit of a hypocrite because I, in the job report of that year, I pointed out that there were more jobs advertised at that point than there had been in 30 years, but there were still significantly more PhDs being conferred that year than there were jobs. And so at that time, I'd emphasized in the, the report then that departments should be acutely conscious of the fact of what they're training their students for. I, I keep bringing this up. And it seems as if when I worry, you know, worry about the job market situation, that seems to be responded to by PhD programs as, well, let's flatten out the number of students that we accept in our program. When I say the job ads are up, that seems to be the, you know, the charge ahead uh, to increase the number of uh, student admissions. And so I'm always very worried about when I write these reports because it always seems to be this sort of dysfunctional response in, in the PhD programs, even though they have, as you can see, somewhat flattened out. I think when I, um, I realized that when I put these two trend lines together, as I do every year, with job advertising, PhDs uh, admitted, that it, or PhDs uh, receiving uh, degrees, that it does create this sort of sense that it's really a simple supply demand thing, that the solutions are to either increase the number of jobs or to reduce the number of doctoral students. And I think one of my other concerns is that it's a much more complex picture. It's much more difficult to simply say, well, if we cut the number of PhD students, that would be, you know, that would solve all the problems on the job market. I think, uh, because I think one of the things we don't keep in, in account is that the number of people who have been receiving full-time, tenure-track academic jobs has actually been going up through the past 30-odd years. So I think it's something that, you know, we, we have a tendency to emphasize the, 
the concern about the fact that there are part-time faculty. And the number of part-time faculty has also been going up, at a, basically at a, at a similar rate. Part-time faculty tends to account for about 40% of the PhDs that are needed in here. But we more or less doubled the number of people who are receiving, you know, who are working full-time over that past 30-year period, even despite all these ups and downs in the academic job market. And it's, it, it makes it a much more complex picture to simply say, you know, cut back on the number of students uh, that you're attending. Um, and I think it's important to keep in mind that the growth you see there in terms of thinking about the larger ecology of, uh, of higher education and its employment is that this increase is based on a very simple increase. I mean, not a very simple increase, but, but a, a general increase in the number of history majors over the past basically over the same period. And this is based in large part on an increase in the number of, of history courses that have been put back into the general education requirements. This happened pretty much through the mid-80s. And what we discovered is that by getting students into those general education requirements, they get exposed to history, they get a couple of history courses that they develop, and that a significant number of them then choose to major in the discipline. And that's really helped between the, the increased number of, of jobs to teach these genetic courses and the increased number of physicians of jobs to teach the students at the upper levels, that's created a significant amount of that increase that you saw there in terms of the number of jobs. Now, as Martin will be quick to, to emphasize, this increase in the gen ed courses has led to, I think, a slightly dysfunctional two-tiering of the employment market within, uh, within higher ed. A lot of those gen ed courses are being taught by uh, adjuncts in a variety of different types of capacities, like in postdocs, the traditional, you know, the sort of classic three-way flyers, or people who are simply doing, people like me, who are simply teaching in sort of an ad application role. Um, and I think one of the concerns, as I talked to department chairs over the past year, uh, was really this past fall, was that they see this two-tier system breaking down, especially at the, the public universities, which is where um, most of our employment uh, takes place, because it's a whole lot easier for them to cut, for uh, institutions to cut the part-time faculty than it is to cut the full-time faculty who have tenure and have to go through all sorts of groups to cut them. So they're seeing there, in a lot of cases, they're seeing those part-time positions dry up. And their response basically been to increase the size of the gen ed courses and the other courses. And I think one of my concerns as I look at this sort of larger ecology of how we get students to choose to major in the system is that if we aren't going to have folks in these part-time positions and they're simply going to increase class sizes and make these courses much less appealing, I think. That's a significant concern in terms of its long-term effect on the number of majors and over the larger cycle, if the majors start to drop, that our jobs uh, are going to begin to drop too. Now the second trend that's really helped sustain a lot of those uh, job increases is a significant increase in the number of retirements. Now, when I got in, in 1988, part of this assumption that there was going to be a big increase in, um, in employment and this shortage of PhDs was premised on the idea that there was going to be a significant amount of retirement uh, from folks who got into higher ed and started teaching in the 60s and early 70s. But one of the changes they didn't really take into account was that they'd done away with policies for mandatory retirement in 1986, I mean, as official federal policy. And as you can see, the effect of that was that folks stayed significantly longer in, uh, in history uh, teaching roles. And we had a significant spike. So a lot of those folks who normally would have retired end up staying into their 60s and even their 70s and uh, And so for a time, over 50% in the, the mid-90s, over 50% of these departments had folks who were past the age of 55. Um, and so that helped to, I think, reduce it's really helped to sustain some of that sense of job crisis. The other issue, of course, was that there was a significant increase in the number of people receiving PhDs in the 90s as well. One of the, my sort of longer term concerns, and it's one of the things I was trying to push to departments this, in this last job work article, is that as you see the trend coming back down in terms of the number of people who are even approaching retirement age, as a long term issue in terms of admission of new doctoral students, I think that's a significant concern, and I think something that needs to be taken into account. I think sort of then looking back over onto the supply side of the issue, I think the supply side is much more complex as well than simply saying, you know, if we would cut some programs and departments would decrease the number of students that they're accepting, that would simply solve a lot of the problems. One of the issues is 
we've had an increase in the number of PhD programs that are actually conferring uh, doctoral programs. Really, we've had an increase of 32 new programs since uh, 1990, and only six have canceled their programs over that same span. So as you can see, we've, we've had a general increase in the number of PhD programs, which adds to the number of uh, people who are uh, coming into doctoral programs and that sort of thing. I think one of the things to keep in mind, however, is mm -hmm. rather than simply, I think there's a tendency, it's what we've happened in the 70s, to focus on these new programs and say, if we just get rid of those or we stop those, that that would be a significant part of the problem. But in part of the, the larger ecology of how we, uh, the, where these PhDs go, most of these PhDs are not going into the larger national market that's um, being interviewed here today. Most of those folks are actually being employed within a fairly local regional market at places that uh, faculty, you know, that a new PhD from Harvard or some other uh, elite university is not likely to go to. And so these new PhD programs are really serving a very specific market that is not, in some ways, uh, I think in many ways, depressing the, uh, or affecting the market for a lot of the sort of folks who would come to an AHA meeting and be looking for jobs. I think that's an important factor to keep in mind. But I think one of the other issues that's a difficulty in terms of trying to track and trying to say something really determinative about how to uh, understand the job market is the, the issue of how many people are actually come out of a PhD program after they're admitted. And I have to say, one of, I think one of the scandals of our discipline is, and really, and I talk to other, uh, other disciplines, it's sort of the same all over, is that PhD programs simply don't keep any real track of their students, what's happening to them, and beyond the basic requirements of their institutional uh, you know, expectations for the, the different stages. They don't keep any substantive track of where their PhDs are going and how long they're staying, what their attrition rates are. And so uh, I've been trying over the past few years to try and develop uh, uh, some data on this and as a sort of a guesstimate, uh, I mean, a fairly informed guesstimate. Uh, I'm going to present this. It's not. I'm not 100% confident in these numbers, but this is the best estimate I can get. It's important to keep in mind that only about 55% of the people who, who enter in, who matriculate into a PhD program are actually going to finish. And I think that's <coughs> something that's understated in way too many programs as, as a piece of information that folks should have. Uh, at, at, after about the five year point, you'll see folks start to move into transitional positions. Um, you know, if you view it as a, the full cohort, the transition, by transitional employment, I mean positions that are postdocs, um, uh, part-time, traditional part-time employment, uh, those sorts of things. But you know, jobs within within academia, which are not tenure-track positions. Um, beyond that, a certain percentage will move into full-time tenure-track employment. But in the end, I think only about 25% of the people who matriculate into a PhD program ultimately come out within 10 years with a tenure track PhD program. Which again gets me back to what I see as sort of the scandal of many PhD programs in terms of they're not, they're training their students for a job market that most of them are not ultimately going to end up uh, employed in. Um, and then a significant percentage are going to end up in non academic employment. Uh, I think, you know, when we get to year 10, got about 17 percent of folks who are still departments report to me that they're still in the they still classified with students but I find it really hard to believe that, that most of those folks are actually going to finish and so generally I, I estimate that about 10 percent of folks are going to probably end up in long term uh, what I call transitional employment but in most cases if you're this sort of permanent freeway flyer position that's not transitional anymore uh, and then about 40 uh, about 40% are going to end up in non-academic employment outside of academia. And I think one of the, most, one of the disappointments I've experienced both in the 90s and then again today is that usually what happens when we enter a job cycle like, like this is that the PhD programs call me as they have over this past uh, few months to say, you know, can you give us some advice on how we can hone our students' training, you know, teaching skills and how, what, what sort of employment opportunities there are outside of academia. But invariably, these things happen. They come to me. They ask me for this advice. I give it to them, and then they go off. And you know, the job cycle goes back into a, a fairly nice state of equilibrium, and it seems to be forgotten. And so, I mean, after you've been there for 20 years and you've gone, you've experienced this over and over again, 
it does begin to seem a little bit dysfunctional. I think one of the um, concerns I've had, I mean, we had this Committee on Graduate Education do a report on this uh, about a decade ago, and basically laid out all these issues, and typically the only people who seem to really read that report and take it very seriously were a few small mid-tier programs, and then a number of the new programs who used it as a, as a blueprint for uh, have new PhD programs. So anyway, I think, I hope this provides, I know, again, this is a sort of a massive overview of how the uh, situation looks, and it's not really, it doesn't really connect to the, the realities of the way most of you are experiencing the job market, but I think, I hope this gives you some better sense of how long we've been in this state of semi-dysfunction and how hard it is to really change the, the, the larger factors that, uh, that go into this situation. So. Thank you.